Okay. Over to you. Thank you, Erin. Thanks everybody for being here today for STC's Knowledge Exchange Panel. I'm Liz Poland. I'm STC's Chief Executive Officer and I'm the moderator for the panel today. Today's session is on the future of work and post-pandemic career planning. And we'll be focusing on how the pandemic has affected work in general. I'm joined today by Aaron Galilee, Director of Operations, Membership and Community Relations, and our distinguished panelists. I'm going to introduce them while Aaron shares a poll so that the um, panelists can and myself can find out who's here today and learn a bit a little bit more about our attendees. So first and foremost, Elisa Bonsignore clarifies complex ideas, developing sustainable content strategies for a global clientele. Her experience spans several industries over more than two decades, with particular focus on making the world a better place through sustainability communications. She is an associate fellow for STC, executive editor of STC's Intercom Magazine, and a certified master gardener, and frequently speaks at conferences and corporate workshops. Thank you for being here, Elisa. Alyssa Fox is a marketing leader and content strategist who thrives on improving customer and partner experience through strong relationships and tailored marketing strategies. With extensive experience in technical marketing content, Alyssa has a passion for leveraging content as a business asset to drive demand, revenue, and customer retention. Alyssa is an STC past president and a member of the American Marketing Association. She speaks at conferences around the world about various leadership, strategy, marketing, and content topics. She loves traveling, reading, good grammar, eating slow, and driving fast. I'm with you there. <laughs> and finally, Dr. Liz Herman serves as Knowledge Content and Training Program Manager of a large consulting firm. She is an STC Associate Fellow, Co-Chair of STC's 2023 Annual Summit, and Co-Chair of STC's Women in Technical Communication Special Interest Group. She's also a member of STC's Intercom Magazine Editorial Committee. So thank you to the three of you for being here. Um, I think everybody's answered the poll at this point. So uh, Aaron, will you share the results? Okay, so we have quite a diverse group of individuals here to this year. Uh, we have people who are um, new members and people who are not, have never been a member, some people for a short time, some people for a long time of STC. Um, quite a few people interested in different topics and different uh, levels of their career, which is, which is helpful. Um, recent graduates, TechCom professionals, and transitioning. We've seen a lot of people transitioning um, since the pandemic began, so that's very helpful. Thank you for filling that out. So today, panelists, what I'd like to start with is to talk about three major trends that I've read about recently um, since the pandemic occurred in 2020, and then have you react to those and tell us what you think uh, the future will be um, for workers in both in general, but also in the field of technical communication. And then we'll go into some other questions. So the first trend I wanna talk about is the increase in remote work, telework, and virtual meetings. Are they likely to continue, in your opinion, maybe less intensely than at the pandemic's peak? Will fully virtual um, or fully remote workplaces evolve into hybrid and more flexible workplaces? And what are the impacts, positive or negative, of this shift? And I'll start today with Alyssa Fox. Great, that's a lot of questions to tackle at once. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> But yeah, I think, um, you know, as far as remote work goes, obviously there was a large um, shift to that during the pandemic itself when we were all sort of forced to do that. Um, if you're a knowledge worker of any kind, of course, there are jobs that required you to still be on site during the pandemic. But um, going from um, largely uh, non-remote to fully remote was a big shift for a lot of people. And I think there are definitely pros and cons to that. And a lot of people really enjoyed that and have found that they can be very productive at their, their home or, you know, working while traveling, et cetera. Um, I do think while we're seeing a lot of emphasis on remote work right now, and people are actually leaving companies or not returning to companies that are asking that their employees return to offices, um, I think it's going to swing the other way, personally. Um, whether we move to a hybrid environment or um, something that's a little more in office, um, because I think long term, I think human beings need that sort of contact with each other. And um, it's very easy for us to get isolated. And, you know, when we're working in our home, we're living in our home, we're um, maybe entertaining in our home, we're doing everything in our home. Um, a lot of people, especially introverts, have really liked that. But even the introverts know that sometimes... <laughs> 
uh, that face-to-face -face collaboration is a little more effective at times and um, um, can be a good supplement to the remote work. I do think remote work is here to stay, um, but I do think it'll swing more into a hybrid uh, environment over the next year or two as people start to realize they need those, those in-person meetings to um, really collaborate in a more effective way on some of the things that they need to work on. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's that's the way it's headed as well. But I'd still like to hear from Liz and Elisa. So Elisa, I'll call on you next. <laughs> well, I mean, as you know, I've been remote for 15 years now, and most of my clients are in Europe. So there's no way that I could just like pop in and visit on a regular basis. So to me, this is perfectly normal. Now, not having everyone else home with me was a whole other ball game, but um, for me, you know, I, I've I've built really effective relationships remotely and I, I know it can be done. Um, so to me, you know, I, I, I would be perfectly happy, you know, being remote permanently. Um, you know, I own my own business. So, it's, you know, obviously an option for me. But I think that for a lot of people, you know, they've, they've gotten used to that. They understand the flexibility now and they're just, you know, they like having that option. And, um, you know, the companies that are driving towards, Full time back in the office are are seeing the attrition from that. Uh, you know, I know my husband when you know they they came back to the office almost right away, and then everybody sat in their individual offices or cubicles and then zoomed in with each other in the building. And it was like, well, why did we commute for this, right? Like, well, what was the point of this exercise? Um, so I think that there's you know I think people are still trying to figure out how to how to make this work best for everybody but certainly you know it's given us the proof of concept that people are and can be effective in a remote environment thanks Lisa and Liz Liz I think you're in a more of a corporate environment unlike Elisa who owns her own company so I'm curious also from the business perspective what what you think about this topic well, I'll pick up on what Alyssa said initially. I, I do think there's going to be a shift, kind of a swing back to a hybrid environment. But to Elisa's point, you know, I, I love working from home. Um, I do have the opportunity to work from home, I would say 90% of the time. Today, I'm in an office because I had to come in for some specific activities. But I think the thing for me is control. I, as the employee, want to control it. Um, you know, Elisa, I don't want to come in for a bunch of Zoom meetings when I'm like, I could have done this from home, saved gas money, saved the commute. Um, but I also wonder sometimes, about my mental health and our mental health when we're all shuttered in our homes like are we okay I wonder about that sometimes like in this pandemic situation and post pandemic and working from home again which I love are we okay mentally like what are the long term effects of working from home um Elisa I'm sure you've probably had to make adjustments you had to make an adjustment when your family was home with you you know you're making it work for you um for the rest of us you know I just want some control around what when I have to come into the office um when I can stay at home um, and then I just wonder for all of us collectively right as technical communicators and as knowledge workers what is the long term effect of of this of this I I do need some people interaction I can tend to be introverted sometimes um so getting out today and coming into the office was like oh I have I have somewhere to go I have a purpose look I'm you know people see me um but I just I I just don't know collectively how are we doing as a whole and how is that going to influence influence us in the years to come yeah I think that's a great point and we have a really good question from the chat so I'm going to pose it to you now uh, Margaret asks, do you think it's necessary to have human interaction within within the office environment or be able to choose who you want to work with or what, what she calls co-work, basically asking how co-working can fit into this? Would one of you like to address that question? Alyssa? I'll, I'll tackle it. Um, I'm assuming she means by co-working, like working in the office alongside somebody. And I will say that my I go to the office once a week. My, I have a team that's spread across the United States and uh, EMEA. And um, I, but half of my team sits in Houston with me. I'm in Houston, Texas. And so we go in once a week and um, we make sure that we could all or we made sure that we could all be there on the same day. Because if I'm going in the office and then a random person from finance that I never work with is in there and a random person from sales and it's it's not 
the, the right people that you need to have that face-to-face -face interaction with. Yeah, I think that's detrimental because it's like, like Liz said, you know, why, why spend my gas and my time driving into the office when I can just do this from home? So I think you need to be a little purposeful about it, um, whether it's once a week or once a month, or perhaps you're on a team that's distributed like mine and you all come to the office once a month or once a quarter um, so you can have that face-to-face -face time. Um, you know, sometimes it's a lot easier to achieve things face-to-face -face than, than remotely. So I do think you should think about who you're going into the office with and making sure it's the right people to make the time most effective. Otherwise, don't waste your, your gas or your money. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And it kind of gets into the second trend. Um, both you and, and Liz have hinted at this, that there's sort of a change in the employee's perspective and the, and the control the employee has over uh, their work environment. So uh, my second trend that I want us to talk about is there's been a shift in employee expectations that resulted in what's been called the great resignation where the more than 25% of workers in the US were either laid off, retired or uh, changed occupations of their own volition. So what shifted do you think from the employee perspective during the pandemic and why? And how will businesses need to continue to improve their processes to keep up with that? Um, Elisa, let's start with you. So I think from my perspective, the, the interesting thing about the pandemic was that we no longer pretended we didn't have families and lives outside of work, right? Um, as, an, as an independent, it was always very important to me to sort of, you know, everything was all about the client, right? Like they did not see that, you know, I had other things going on. And um, once it became like, I mean, I had a colleague in Germany and it was hilarious because she was set up, you know, with the, with the blur screen behind her, but she was in her kid's playroom. And I could tell that she was in something childlike because the blur was all kinds of bright colors and whatever. I'm like, what's back there? She's like, oh, I have three kids under the age of six. And I'm like, I've worked with you for years and I did not know this, right? Like <laughs> the things that we found out about each other and the, the you know, and understanding the, the boundaries there. And, you know, especially when everybody was home and the kids were remote schooling and all that, working the schedules around that to accommodate other people and to, you know. So I think you're in a position now where employees expect that they're bringing their whole person to work, right? It's, it's you're not, you're not, hiding the fact that you have a life. You are not hiding the fact that you have children. You're not hiding the fact that you have elder care issues. We all know that this is going on because we've all seen this unfold over the last few years, right? So there are more expectations that um, some, some amount of grace will be given <laughs> to some degree, right? That like, if I need flexibility, if I need, you know, to coordinate things around, you know, my life, that that should be given. And if it becomes the sort of thing where, you know, the employer has a, you know, a tracker on your mouse to make sure that you're working, you know, nonstop for the eight hours, then that's not the kind of relationship that people are going to want to have with their employer, right? And that sort of reevaluation has led to a lot of the shifts of, oh, wait, I don't have to put up with this anymore. I don't have to work in this kind of environment. There are other people hiring. What am I doing here? <laughs> um, so I think that, you know, that, that, Employees are looking for more and employers need to meet that. Yeah, I, I like what you said about um, the whole, bringing the whole person, which I've heard as, as the employee, the employer uh, humanizing the workplace, making it more you know, accessible to people because we are all humans. Um, so I'll move next to Liz. I think we are examining work, right? We are re-examining what work means to us in the pandemic. And our value system has shifted a little bit. So it wasn't just like, oh, employers can do better. It was the pandemic and people were dying and our families needed us and people were sick. And I don't know about everybody on this call, but for myself, I really really reevaluated what does work mean to me and what is my role in work, right? And um, in the grand scheme of things, things, it's, it's not the most important thing on my list. Um, you know, my family is, and I think that put perspective, put into perspective for a lot of people. So it's, you know, things have been changing in work. Employers have been changing to meet demands, to meet hybrid situations, to offer more remote work, but the pandemic just accelerated that. And I think we're still operating in some kind of space of fear, um, you know, people are worried about, you know, yes, we have we have vaccines now and people can get boosted and but what does it mean the next time, you know, it happens again, because it will happen again, it might be a different variant. And I think people 
are concerned about their safety and there's fear there where people are, you know, still kind of pushing back against a hybrid environment. And employers have to match that, right? They have to understand the feelings and the values of the employees before they can say, okay, y'all, October 1st, everyone's coming back to work. Well, wait a minute, October 1st, I don't know, it's flu season, you know, maybe there's going to be a resurgence of the, um, of the virus, you know, we just don't know what's going to happen. And I think that that is driving how we feel about work and what I, as an employee need from my employer. I need to feel safe coming into the office today. I know what the procedures are. You know, I, I understand how they're keeping me safe. And I think that's still very much, much in the forefront um, of people's minds. And I think it's why we have a lot of people coming into technical communication, right? So part of our, part of us being here today are the, is the technical communication thread that runs right through all of us. And I think that's why people are, um, you know, moving from industries that are really high touch into our industry where you can probably find something remote. You can work from home. It can be a little less touchy um, and helping people feel safe and secure. Yeah, that's a great point. And we do have a lot of people who are transitioning into tech com. So we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Uh, Alyssa, I want to give you a chance to respond to this, this trend. Yeah, I agree with what, what both uh, Alisa and Liz said. And I think there's also an element of sort of proof that we can work remotely and still be impactful and still keep a business afloat and you know be able to collaborate and all that. I mean, we live in a time of amazing technology. Um, we can do things with technology. I mean, just sitting here talking to each other on a screen, you know, right now we do that all the time, um, you know, at work and everything. And I think I know at my particular company, our CEO prior to the pandemic was very about having everybody in the office. He was a little old school. He was that's how he always, you know, grew up in the business and that sort of thing. And when we all proved that not only did could we maintain the business during the pandemic, but our numbers, I work for in a cybersecurity company. So unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, you know, the pandemic was actually good for our business because there was so much remote work and security needed between, you know, your various uh, internet connections and all that fun stuff that we actually did really well. But he was very surprised that we could keep the business afloat as well as still work together and collaborate and manage our families as needed and, and the care that we needed to do for anyone that got sick. So I think just the, the proof that, hey, this does work gives employees a lot more leverage because we can say, you can't come back and tell me it doesn't work because before it would have been like, oh, I don't want you working from home. I can't see what you're doing. But now we've proved it out that it does work. And uh, for a lot of industries, not all industries, but a lot of industries, including tech comm, marketing, knowledge work, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that plays into it too. Yeah, good point. Okay, so I want to get to the third uh, trend that we want to discuss today, and this may not be one that's very obvious to a lot of people, but I've read a little bit about it, and so I wanted to pose it today. Um, that that COVID-19 resulted in a faster adoption of automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Do you panelists believe that is true, and how will it impact workers? Um, I'll start this time with Alyssa. So I think there's elements of that that are true and elements that were probably already happening and maybe accelerated by the pandemic. Um, I think, you know, all of us that have worked with any kind of technology, bringing technology back into it, knows that um, any kind of automation that we can put in place to make the mundane tasks of our jobs easier, quicker, you know, less that humans have to do and help the humans focus on the critical thinking parts of the jobs, the parts that we need to have the relationships with our customers, our partners, our clients. Um, I think that a lot of that was already happening. Um, I do think in some senses, the uh, pandemic probably accelerated that a little bit um, from the simple sense that, you know, we had people that were out of the workforce for a long time, whether they were sick, a family member was sick, they got long COVID, you know, a number of reasons um, for that. Um, but overall, I don't, see a, um, an overall um, replacement of people due to automation, due to the pandemic. Um, I haven't seen that pre-pandemic either, um, or even post-pandemic, if, if you call us a post-pandemic. Um, I think the, the parts where automation come into play are the parts where they were always going to come into play and should come into play, which is reducing that um, mundane uh, set of tasks that we need to do as workers. Okay. Uh, Liz, how about you? Yeah, I... I agree with what Alyssa said. You know, I think we, 
like, I, I'll just be frank, the promise of AI, like, yes, it's coming, but I don't know that there's been some radical thing that has happened since spring of 2020 with AI and automation. Definitely agree with Alyssa that, you know, tasks, automating tasks, still very significant. Like in my um, corporate environment, if we want to come into the office, we fill out a form, you know, they make sure that it's safe for us, that there's space, et cetera, et cetera. So that's great, right? I don't have to think about that. It's very easy to do. Um, but I think what happened is there was actually more of a human connection that happened the past two years um, because suddenly you had to rely on each other. I, I'm not in the office. I don't know how this works. I don't know how my Zoom works. I don't know, like I don't go to our SharePoint site. Where are things on our SharePoint site? I think that the human connection kind of for me trumped artificial intelligence, trumped digitization. Yes, companies had to figure that out and Alyssa's company had to help keep, keep companies secure. Um, but what I saw, and I come at this from a knowledge management perspective, is that people were willing to share. Um, and from a technical communication perspective, um, you know, we often kind of hoard our knowledge because it's our power. But in the pandemic, think of all the great things that were happening, people sharing with other employees, hey, this is how you do it. Here's how to make a mask. Here's how to make your own hand sanitizer. Um, hopefully without like blowing up your family, right? Safely making hand sanitizer. Don't leave it in the vehicle. Um, but I think there was like that human connection for me that really trumped it. And I feel like we're kind of starting to get away from that now again, because we're over that crisis. It's kind of, we're getting back into some kind of steady state. Um, but I hope we don't lose that because there was some great knowledge sharing um, I think this is maybe something, Liz, that came out of the pandemic, like how do we reach members, how do we reach non-members and share about technical communication in the Society for Technical Communication, um, that human connection is something that happened and I hope to see it continue. Yeah, I like that perspective a lot because it sort of encourages something I've been arguing for years, which is that there'll never be a moment where a machine can do everything a human can do. There's a certain kind of processing and, and, and knowledge, you know, ownership that only a human can do and even if a, a computer can do it up to a point then a human's going to have to go in and review that work anyway so um but elisa i want to hear what you have to say as well so i think it's been more than a decade now that we've been hearing about you know oh ai and automation it's coming for us right ha uh, and and i feel like there's been that that buzz and that fear around that um but i have not seen that come to pass in the past decade or the past two years right um I think that when you come down to it, English is so complicated and nuanced. I mean, maybe other languages are different, but like it's really hard to translate things right with English, right? To 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 interpret things correctly, to automate things, to 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 do it in a way that that speaks to people. And I think that if you know, as as Liz was saying, the connections that we have, right? So much of what we do really comes down to an effective story. How do we communicate something in an effective way that connects with the user in a way that they need it, in a way that they want it, in a way that resonates, that, that you know, that sticks with them? And, and you know, whether that's something as, as simple as, you know, the bullet points in a list of steps or, or something more complicated in, in a sales pitch, like, it's all about knowing the audience and doing, you know, being able to speak to that effectively. And that's not something that a machine to this point can do. So, I mean, you might be able to automate some very simple tasks in terms of, you know, very, 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 very basic stuff. But for the most part, I just haven't seen that come to pass up to this point. Fair enough. So uh, we've talked about three big trends. I want to now focus more narrowly on how this is going to affect technical communication or these trends will, from your opinions, uh, affect technical communication. Um, just because I, I know a lot of the people attending the session today are either already technical communicators or thinking about becoming them. So they might be interested in what, what they could see down the pike. Um, Liz, I'll start with you. Well, it's a great time. We we welcome you all. So welcome to technical communication. The more, the merrier. Um, I love it. I, I'm happy there are new people coming into technical communication. Um, I think 
um, with the pandemic, we really saw what the communication challenges were, right? There's a lot of lessons learned in the pandemic about communication and factual information and what people were putting out. Um, and so I think that people are looking at that, maybe who really didn't think about a career in communication or technical communication are looking at that kind of with fresh eyes. And even people in the industry, um, Elisa, Alyssa, myself, you, Liz, Aaron, who have been in the industry for a long time, that was still fascinating to see, like what the hits and misses were from the pandemic from a technical communication perspective. Um, so it's a great time to be here. Um, I think that, um, again, going back to what I said about high touch positions versus like, maybe I can do something that's a little less people-y. I, I think that's why people are drawn to our profession. So I think there's some definite opportunities coming out of the pandemic um, with content strategy, technical communication, um, uh, you know, guidelines around um, health and wellness information. Um, that makes it a great time, but also because people are looking to have a different kind of work environment, and that's understandable. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's definitely going to be part of part of the future for this field. Elisa, how about you? What uh, What are the three? Well, you know, I'm all over the lot less peopley, so right. <laughs> that's that's my whole that's all my whole mindset. Um, no, having having been independent, I mean, there's there's so many opportunities there for you know if you're looking for that opportunity for uh, you know the low touch uh, you know distant work uh, you know if you like working from home it's, it's all it's all good here um, you know I'm I'm a huge fan of it but uh, I know it would kill Alyssa <laughs> she couldn't handle the you know the not being you know with the other people but. Uh, no, I, I think that going forward, there's going to be a lot more opportunity. And um, even as we, you know, I mean, you, you know, there's all the buzz about, you know, economic downturns and whatever, but that doesn't seem to be playing out. People still seem to be hiring. And even in the downturns, there's always been strong demand for contract workers. So I think this is a good place to be. And I think the timing is right. And as as Liz said, you know, there's no shortage of things that need to be communicated. And I think that we we saw the gaps in the communications, you know, for those last two years and that we're, you know, we're really starting to see the importance of, you know, communications across the board and, and doing it right the first time. Right. Thank you. And Alyssa. Yeah, just to piggyback off what Alyssa just said, I think the pandemic and the communication stuff took a little bit of the emphasis off the technical, which we've always kind of focused on. Oh, we're communicators, but we're technical communicators and put a little more focus on the communicator part. You know, we've talked a lot about the foundational skills that you learn in TechCom and how you can apply that to so many other careers. And I think the pandemic and the communication slash lack of communication around some of the issues uh, that we faced during the pandemic really opened eyes to a lot of possibilities for us to branch out into that we might not have thought about before. Um, the other thing that I see here is uh, for tech commerce is, you know, I think sometimes when you're in person, a lot of what we do is understanding the product or solution or service that we are um, writing for, understanding how our users, how it helps our users make their jobs easier and that sort of thing. But when we're all in an office environment, it's really easy to just turn around to the developer next to you and go, okay, how does this, how does this work? Whereas when you're working from home, I think it takes just as much as uh, effort or less effort to actually go in there and figure it out yourself. And I think that always makes a more um, productive and better uh, technical communicator if they're, they're a little more hands-on with products and services and solutions. So they're kind of, in my mind, forced a little bit more to actually get in the product and service um, and solution and really get that deeper understanding, which yes, we should have if we're writing about that product and under trying to help you know users understand how we can help them. Um, but I think in this particular environment of the remote work and potential hybrid uh, work, that we have a lot more opportunity to, to dig in a little bit more. Yeah, I like that too. And, and it gives uh, employees a little bit more agency in what they're working on, which I think, you know, has been a long time uh, argument in TechCom that different, different silos own information. And this allows the technical communicator really to absorb the whole product or the whole work environment. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and ask you all if you have any tips or resources that you'd like to share with attendees today about how they could reinvent their careers going forward uh, due to the changes from the pandemic. Uh, Lisa, I'll start with you. So I think that um, one of the underestimated things in, in all communications is 
you know, the soft skills, which everybody sort of, I hate the word soft skills. I really hate it. Um, <laughs> Alyssa's not a yes, yes. Um, I mean, it's really essential skills, right? I feel like soft skills kind of, do I, do I, do I jump on this third rail? It feminizes it in a way that I think, you know, oh, those are your skills to have, not, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm powerful. I'm, you know, you know I'm, I'm an aggressive go-getter. I, I shouldn't have those skills, right? No, they're essential skills. There are things like critical thinking and interpersonal skills and, and time management, project management that are important to you, whatever your role, right? And especially in communications, you know, we have so many people that we interact with. We have so many balls in the air at all times. You know, we, we need to be able to pull all this stuff together and really, you know, make those, make those skills work for us. And I think that if you've got a solid foundation in those essential skills, I think that'll make your transition to any communications field a lot easier um, because that will pave the way for the relationships that you're going to need to be successful to do what you do. Yeah, thank you. And I see Aaron's putting some um, links that I was doing some research in preparation for this panel and found that there are quite a few uh, economic uh, agencies and some other groups who have done a lot of research already about the change of, of work patterns and the changes of employee and employer mindsets. Um, so she's put the links for those uh, research facilities in the chat, which is great. Thank you, Aaron. So Liz, I'll come to you. Uh, any tips or suggestions or resources you want to share? Well, I want to commend the group that joined us today because that's a tip, right? You're here, you're learning. And I think we have to just continue to be open, open to learning so we understand kind of where the trends are going and what the shifts are. Um, and so congratulations for, you know, deciding to make time for this today. I think that's a great tip that I can give you, you know, look at what's out there. Um, you know, I'm going to put a plug in for LinkedIn. I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. I find out a lot of stuff from LinkedIn and that's tied to your network. And so that is a tip that I give everybody, anybody who comes to me, I ask them about the health of their network um, because you can really get so much information and content and wisdom from the network that you build. So for people who are on the phone today, um, you know, I welcome you to link in with me, um, you know, send me a connection request. Let's, let's stay in touch. Um, that's the biggest tip I can give people is the power of network and then lifelong learning. Just always be open. Um, if I I had closed myself off to opportunities years ago and just said, I'm a technical communicator, then I wouldn't be a program manager. I wouldn't, you know, have a program management um, certification. I wouldn't, um, you know, have the career opportunities that I do because I opened myself up and didn't look at myself through a single lens. Um, and speaking of a single lens, I will just add one thing. I, I do think employers are looking for people who are kind of multi-skilled, right? Um, you know, that you can wear multiple hats, you can move and pivot, especially in technical communication. You know, can you do a little marketing stuff? Can you do a little policy stuff? Can you look at our website? How, what about our social media strategy? Um, you know, I know that that sometimes, um, you know, it splits us a little bit into kind of the role that we're trying to play. Um, but that's a takeaway that I would give to this group as well is, you know, be multi-skilled. Um, think about what skills you bring to the table and make sure your employer or a future employer knows what those skills are. You're more than just a technical communicator, right? Um, there's so much more you can do with that from a communication perspective. Yeah, I like that, Liz. It's very much more of a well-rounded career path than just very narrowly focused. And I've read some some articles about um, employers who are also helping people reskill as they come in and upskill, which, you know, means you don't just stay in your lane, you actually end up learning something above you or, or the ability to grow within your company, because companies are, you know, really trying to keep people uh, now. So thank you. Uh, Alyssa tips or tricks? Yeah, I think what Liz was just talking about is adaptability, right? And being able to learn those new skills in the lifelong learning, which goes back to Elisa's point about having those essential skills. I really feel like, um, you know, if you have the right set of core skills, you can shift to a bunch of different jobs and um, really uh, working on building those out, understanding, you know, what are people looking for in soft skills or essential skills, so to speak, because 
I've seen people be in like seven different jobs, you know, across an organization because they have the right skill set to adapt, to know the business, to be able to communicate the business. And I really feel like a lot of it does go back to communication. And especially in the type of environment we're in, the remote environment or the hybrid environment, that communication becomes way more important than it used to. It is a lot harder to communicate online with multiple people in different online calls than having, you know, seven people in a room where you can look around and see everybody's body language and face and all of that. So um, my, my tip would be brush up on those skills, like uh, Elisa and Liz mentioned, for sure. Um, lots of different ways to do that. Um, I would recommend the Radical Candor book. It is outstanding um, for talking, being able to have challenging yet comfortable conversations with your team members, whether you're a leader or a manager or not. You know, being able to be direct with somebody but still be caring is a skill set that not everybody has. And if you have that skill set, you can go a lot of different places. Um, the other things I would recommend are um, a, a few LinkedIn follows. Um, I use my LinkedIn network extensively as well. I would recommend Amber Nasland. Uh, she works at LinkedIn. She was actually our closing keynote at um, the SDC Summit uh, this year. I was going to say last year. It was earlier this year. Um, she posts a ton of things about essential skills and leadership. I would recommend Scott Galloway, who is a former professor, and I forgot where he, where he was a professor at, but the insights that he brings into work and how humans are and the economy and how those all blend together are fascinating. And then I would also recommend Punk Rock HR. Um, it's Laurie Rudiman is the person that uh, covers that, R-U-E-I-T-T-I-M-A-N, I believe, but just look up Punk Rock HR. And again, they, they tackle a lot of HR issues or what I would consider essential, essential skill topics um, with a really interesting perspective and a little bit more kicked into the 21st century than perhaps, you know, your old school HR kind of topics are. And I find it really fascinating some of the stuff they bring out. Thanks, Alyssa. What great mm -hmm. references you offered. Um, and I also would say, in, in addition to those kinds of LinkedIn um, networking, you know, connections to follow, also, if you're in a certain field, if there are people in that field who are known, you know, for what they do, definitely connect with them. I mean, people are are so willing to share information. And at the end of the session today, we'll have everyone here uh, who's here's LinkedIn profile available for all of you to, to connect with them and ask other questions. So one of the things uh, you've all mentioned uh, in, in, in tips is to continue to learn lifelong learning. Uh, one of the things STC is doing next, just next week, next Monday and Tuesday, is an online seminar that Alyssa uh, helped us curate. She was the chair of the seminar on career planning during a pandemic or post-pandemic, um, if, if we're calling it post-pandemic. Um, Alyssa, will you talk a little bit about the seminar and what your, your idea was for it? And, and, sure. and then we'll, we'll move on to Lisa and Liz, who are also speaking at it. Yeah, absolutely. So my thought behind the whole thing is, you know, just as we've discussed today, a lot of people's work lives have changed, right? Uh, maybe they've changed jobs, maybe they haven't changed jobs, but all of us, I think, have been impacted by the pandemic in some way, in the way that we approach our job, the way we think about our job, or potentially the way that we want to work and have a job. So that was kind of the impetus for the theme uh, for the online seminar. Um, I think there's a number of things that we've discussed today that uh, we're also, we will also be discussing there that come into play when we're talking about really examining what we want to do for work. You know, I would think that most people would want to work to live, not live to work. And so it's kind of about making the best out of that. Um, personal branding, what kind of branding do I need to do in case I do want to switch jobs? You know, I've decided I don't like this corporate nine to five anymore. I want to go out on my own or I only want to work part time or I want to switch industries or move into tech or or something like that. Um, that's a big part of it. Um, understanding how the pandemic has potentially impacted maybe your schedule, your um, way that you work, remote, hybrid, being forced back in the office. Um, maybe you like an office and everybody else wants to be remote, how do you deal with that? Um, and then we also have some topics around just, you know, what have we done in the past, maybe with our essential skills or the way technical communicators have worked with SMEs and other potential um, coworkers, and how has that shifted? Has it shifted at all? And if so, how has it shifted? What can we do in this new world um, to make those interactions more productive and efficient and effective? So those are some of the topics we'll be covering. Um, I think, you know, as people do examine what they're doing with their work life um, post-pandemic or in this pre-post pandemic or whatever when now, um, hopefully post worst of the pandemic, um, it's something that we're all thinking about and um, we're all impacted by it because of the way our, our work lives have changed over the last couple of years. So that's, that's what we're hoping to get out of it. 
Yes, thank you. And for those of you on the call who may not know about it, Aaron's put a link to the seminar in the in the chat. Um, it is two days, it is 10 sessions, and two of the sessions are highlights from the summit. So if you weren't able to come to our conference and want to hear a couple of those speakers, um, you can still register and come. Uh, Liz, what are you speaking on at the, at the seminar? Yes, I'm very about. excited to be chosen to speak at the seminar. Uh, I look at the lineup. It's terrific lineup. I'm specifically talking about knowledge management strategies uh, for the great resignation. So organizations are losing knowledge, right? People are leaving and they're usually leaving quickly. Like here's my two weeks. Peace out. Thanks. Um, you're not going to, I'm not going to do an exit interview. You're not going to really be able to kind of extract the tacit knowledge that I have in my head about my job. Um, so I'm giving some, I'm giving technical communicators some strategy to deal with that. And my perspective is that I I believe in the skill set of technical communicators so much that I try to help them see themselves in elevated positions. And so I'm going to give just if you consider yourself kind of a run of the mill technical communicator, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can play a part in preserving your organization's knowledge. But then I'm also going to start to, you know, give you some concepts to do some higher level thinking about knowledge management in your organization and what you can do and what the organization can do to really kind of stem the flow of knowledge loss that's that's happening. I mean, I think 68 million people left jobs or changed jobs in the last 12 months. It's some kind of crazy number um, and organizations are suffering a little bit. So that's what I'm talking about. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you for that recap. And I'll just mention, yes, Alyssa pointed out it's two half days. So we're just part of each day, um, one to five Eastern. So if you can't take a whole day off work, maybe you can take a half day. And if you can't take time off next week at all, they are all recorded. And anyone who registers will get all of the recordings um, after the seminar. So yes, thank you. Alyssa, Elisa, we've got too many A names, I'm telling you. I know, I had two Liz's and you know, know. it only just makes it complicated, right? Erin's the odd one out, right? Yep. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about what I didn't know I didn't know when I started freelancing. And uh, I've had a lot of people contact me over the last two years and say, you know, eh, let me think about this. You know, I'm not sure that I really want to be in corporate anymore. Or, you know, especially lately, a lot of people moved from their you know, original location because the company went remote and now the company's not remote anymore. And now you're in, you know, Omaha, but your company is in San Francisco and now what? Uh, so, you know, are you looking for another remote job? Do you have to move again? Are you looking to go freelance? A lot of people are trying to figure that out. And uh, I'm going to start with some of the basics uh, that I wish I had known. Uh, a lot of it goes around money. I, thought, I mean, if I went into everything I didn't know, you know, we could be here for three days, but uh, <laughs> we're, in an hour, we're going to, we're going to condense it down. And a lot of it is about money and just trying to figure out out the fundamentals of whether or not this is going to work for you in the first place and whether it's a viable option or whether you should be considering something else. Because um, I think that's the most important thing to share with people at this point, just getting that, uh, getting those fundamentals out there. How, how great. I, I think it all sounds really fascinating. And I like that each of you comes from a different perspective that maybe other people are, you know, in the same situation or thinking about either going corporate or moving to freelancing. So I think that's great. Um, do you have any closing thoughts? Is there anything that we didn't get a chance to talk about today that you all want to, to say or to bring up about uh, the future of work and or post-career um, planning from the pandemic? And I'll remind the uh, people in attendance that they're welcome to ask any questions of the panelists. We have a little time for Q&A if there are questions. Anyone want to have anything additional to add? Uh, I just want to I was just going to add that, you know, we talked a little bit about um, employee wellness and um, sort of work life balance, which I hate that phrase. I prefer the term work life integration because there is no balance ever. <laughs> it's just, it's how are you going to get through your day doing all your personal stuff and all your work stuff, you know? I think, you know, aside from where we work, you know, whether it's office, home, work while we're traveling, you know, go for a month to sit on the beach and we work from the beach. Um, there's also all the elements of now that that has kind of in, been introduced into our psyche. It's the part of, okay, what else does this company offer in the way of diversity, equity, and inclusion? What does it offer in the way of what my benefits are? Perhaps I don't want a bigger salary. Perhaps I just want to be able to work from everywhere, you know, and maybe I'm willing to take a smaller salary for that. Um, it's, it's opened the door to 
really make it more of an employee market than an employer market. And I think the employers that don't recognize that are the ones that are, are going to die on the vine. And um, yeah, they might limp along for a little while and, and have some people that feel trapped in their job or feel like they can't make a change or whatever. But now that we all know as employees that all of these other options are out there and we do have more options because we can work remote now. So we are looking at different companies. We're not tied to the 10 big companies in Houston for you know, my case, for example, and that sort of thing. We're looking at a lot of other things besides location of work. And um, I think that is, the future of work is going to be heavily impacted by that. And employers need to take note of that. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that employer benefits are going to get better as a result of this. Um, someone brought up medical benefits in the chat and especially how that relates to freelance, but I've definitely seen um, employers realizing they have to meet employees halfway. And I love that right now employees are empowered because I think that's one positive result from the pandemic. Uh, Liz or Elisa, do you have any other? Liz, I have I have one thing um, that I want to bring up, and actually, Elisa made me think of it. Um, talking about the economic downturn, like I live and work in the Washington D.C. area, and you know, technical communication is needed. So even in times of economic downturn, um, look at all the policies that have come out recently. So I, I don't want to make this a political discussion, but like there's you know the economic growth policy and there's the student loan forgiveness policy. And I can tell you from the perspective here in the DC area, we need people, technical communicators, ideally to translate the policy into something that the people can understand. So if you're if you have student loans, there's a whole policy, a whole federal register, right, about how to get your loans forgiven, but we need people to take that complex information and make it simple and put it in plain language. So um, there's a lot of work available in the government. There's a lot of work available with government contractors. So if you happen to be someone who's new and or who's looking um, to transition in, you know, definitely recommend that you check out USA, uh, USA Jobs. Um, because they they need people to translate all this policy work. Yeah, that's a great point. I remember years ago when we had all the tax um, tax the uh, voting issues and tax forms too. I mean, that's another whole area where technical communicators often have to get involved to help the average Joe understand what these complex forms are are saying and asking for. Elisa. Well, and what Liz was saying, there's so much training uh, for new uh, new technologies and things embedded into the, the the policies that have come out in the last year. And so, you know, we're going to need more people in instructional design. We're going to need more people in content design. We're going to need more people trying to find ways to, you know, retool the workforce and to move them away from, you know, these you know, from the fossil fuels, you know, where we're trying to, you know, get people from, you know, from, from coal to solar, right? And, and you know, how are we retooling the workforce to, to train them for that? And we definitely need people who can communicate those things in a way that, you know, makes it easy to get everybody off the, you know, hit the ground running. Right. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Do you think that employers will try to reverse the course of making an employee market? Uh, I don't think that will happen in the short term. I don't know about you all, but I think you know, the ability to, to have more say and in, in, in the freedom to find jobs that have the benefits or, you know, maybe as Alyssa said, you don't need as much salary, but you want these other things, they mean more to you. Uh, what do you all think? About I think them? they're always trying to make it a non-employee market. I mean, <laughs> I think the cat's out of the bag. I, Right. And I like that surprise, but like, I don't, you know, we can't lure people into the office now with, you know, free dry cleaning and, you know, and taco Tuesday anymore. Like that's just not enough to cut it. And um, so we need, you know, actual benefits like, you know, healthcare. Oh gosh, who would guess? Um, and, you know, to, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't scroll up to see whose point. Uh, Susie, right. um, yes, the healthcare situation sucks. Uh, for freelance, there's no getting around that. But um, at least now, I mean, when I started 15 plus years ago, like we didn't even have the open exchange, you know, you were just hosed, there was no getting around it. So I mean, at least now we have the state exchanges and you can buy healthcare, um, which you didn't have really the option to do previously. Um, but you know, whether that's the healthcare that you need or you want, that's a whole other topic and it varies state by state. So, you know, depending on where you are, it may be worse than others, but, you know, at least at least there's something, at least you have some amount of safety net that you can purchase. Right, thank you for addressing that. 
Um, what are your thoughts about working with new employees, new technical writers in a remote environment? Valentina is asking. Do you feel like you want them in the office more than you would a more experienced writer? Everyone shaking heads. Not now. from my perspective. I, I mean, yeah. oh, I, I just work, no, I just had interns, tech writing, uh, not tech writing, marketing interns, but um, they were actually doing some tech writing too, and they were fully remote because they had to be, and um, had no problems. I think again, if you've got the right guidance, the right leadership, you know, checking in with them like you need to do. If you've got the right supervisor, um, then then that works completely fine. Uh, because we just didn't have a choice starting out so that and it goes back to that proof thing right it worked so why would we make them come in if we don't have to it requires a manager with soft skills <laughs> and those essential skills that you need because those are the people who can you know really integrate with you know people wherever they are yeah and you have to make an effort right i mean this is where we're at in the virtual environment. You can't just assume that someone's going to start and be like, they're fine. I don't hear from them. They're fine. I mean, you have to, you know, if you have new technical communicators or just new employees, you have to make time to engage with them, have some planned purposeful time, whether it's a few meetings a week to make sure they're, you know, they're doing okay. I mean, I'm kind of thinking like this is a new entry level and maybe not like a senior hire, right? Um, but just it has to be planned and purposeful. Um, and, you know, you have to engage with them and make sure that they have what they need to be successful. I don't think that anybody really thrives in a virtual environment if, if they're just like, here you go. Well, I don't know. I'll talk to you next month. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> just be purposeful and engage them. But I don't think they need to be in the office. I think you can totally make it work remotely without seeing them face to face. And we've all become so familiar with being on camera now and making sure we're seen and presentable. And we've gotten very used to that, but does it impact at all the interview process? Because I keep reading that interviews are much better in person, but I know Liz and, and Alyssa, you both hire people. Do you feel like that's true or do you think there's- Well, let me, let me just matter? speak up because I mean, I don't interview interview in the same way, but I'm always talking to new clients about new projects, right? right? So I'm interviewing constantly um, in, in a way. Um, and I've never had a problem with, I mean, even before Zoom, I'd never had a problem with it. You just talk and it comes yeah. down to communication skills, right? right? And it's, it's about opening that conversation and asking the right questions and knowing how to build a relationship with people and those come down to the essential skills. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious uh, what Alyssa thinks of this, but I think that the ways that you can kind of show yourself in a face-to-face -face interview are the same ways that you can show yourself in a virtual interview. And what I mean by that is, are you on time? Right. Are you prepared? Are you... If I ask you at the end, if I have, if you have any questions, please have a question for me, come up with something. Have you done your research on the organization? I mean, I guess I'll call them tells, Alyssa. The tells are there, whether it's in person or face-to-face, -face, I think. So I don't really know that I distinguish between the two because I, you just, the tells are there if they're gonna be good or not so great. Yeah, the, the, the couple of things I'll, I'll mention about virtual interviews is one, you know, we tend to be a little more casual because we're virtual now. And I've actually had somebody show up for an interview that looked like they just rolled out of bed. But again, if they showed up to an in-person interview like that, I'd probably have the same first impression. You know, I'm, I'm fine with casual. I'm not fine with like, didn't even like comb your hair. Kind of thing. I want you to feel like- You don't you, do sloppy. <laughs> yeah, I want to feel like you want this job, right? The other thing I have actually seen, interestingly enough, and I've had this happen to two colleagues, um, people coming and saying that their camera is broken and will not get on video for the interview. They go through the whole interview process with a quote, broken camera. Then when the person starts at the company, they realize it's a different person. That has happened to two of my colleagues. So I think that's something you got to watch for. You know, you need to determine if you're going to require that camera be on and figure out a way that that person with a supposed broken camera can actually be on camera. Um, because I've now seen, you know, the first time I would have been like, oh, that's weird. That's crazy. But now that it's happened to two of my colleagues, um, I am like, no, you must turn your camera on. And then you must turn your camera on when you start the job so I can see that I'm talking to the same person. Um, generally, you, sometimes you can tell by voice, but sometimes you can't. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that you might have to watch for a little more trickery with some employees hopefully most people are not doing that but it is something to look out for yeah that's a really good point i hadn't heard about that but i could see how that could happen mm -hmm. um, just like almost fraud in showing yourself as someone you're not in an interview so i, I assume none of those people got the job in the end 
Anyway, well, thank you so much to the three of you for being here today. You have been wonderful panelists. I'm going to pass things back to Aaron Galloway, but I wanted to thank you, and you've had a lot of thank yous and kudos in the in the chat. So we really appreciate your time today and sharing your expertise on this topic. So, Aaron, I will send it back to you. Thank you, Liz. And I just wanted to share a couple extra slides just for how you can connect with us. I uh, put the LinkedIn links for all of our presenters here. Uh, and there are a couple of email addresses here where you can reach out to STC staff if you have uh, further questions or if you want to learn more about STC or our programs, the seminar, we're more than happy to help. Um, there's also a link here at the bottom of our page for the um, for how to connect just with STC on our uh, our own social media platform. So please go ahead and connect to us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and our Slack workspace. Our Slack workspace is kind of an internal listserv where you can connect with members, and this is a great way just to connect with others like yourself and to build that network as they were discussing earlier in the program, just to start talking to other technical communicators and um, get to know who they are. And on this final slide I want to share, um, Bear with me one second. Here are some upcoming programs we would love to invite you to. The first is the post-pandemic world online seminar that we just spoke about um, at the end of this program. We'd love to see you there. That's the link that I shared in the chat that will give you information about the program. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to STC at STC.org or membership at STC.org, and we can help you with any questions you might have. And then also join us for our future knowledge exchange panel. The next one happening on uh, Halloween, so we thought it'd be a great one to discuss techcom fears and failures <laughs> and how to overcome some of the obstacles people feel as they're starting out in the industry and how sometimes fears and failures are at the end of it all and just how to pick yourself and keep going. So we would invite you to join us for future techcom um, tech programs for our, our knowledge exchange panel discussions, our new member meetups. There's a lot of education opportunities on our website, which you can see them all at scc.org down below is just the we are techcom link and somebody had said this earlier in the program about the recordings yes um these knowledge exchange programs are recorded so please feel free to check out um, the recording of this program soon and also any past recordings that we have about past discussions thank you for joining us today we look forward to seeing you next time bye everybody bye everybody thank you so much hey aaron we should dress up in costumes for that <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being